The Buddha never named his teachings Buddhism. He called them Dhamma Vinaya. The Dhamma is what he discovered. In the course of trying to find the deathless, the truths that were conducive to finding the deathless. The Vinaya is what he formulated as rules for the monastic sanghas that he did, that he founded. But the two go together, because the rules, of course, are based on principles of Dharma. And often it's useful to look at how the Buddha worked out some of the implications of how these larger principles should be applied to the rules that govern the life of the Sangha. You can learn a lot of important lessons, even if you're not a monk. Take, for instance, the Buddha's analysis of actions for the sake of determining what is and is not an offense. There are different factors that can come into play. There's the action, there's the object, there's the intention, there's the perception, and there's the result. And the different offenses are analyzed. In some cases only a few of those factors come into play, others all five. For example, take the, the precept against killing. There has to be the intention that you want to kill the animal, and then if you actually have an object which really is the animal, you perceive it correctly as an animal. You go through the act, and the result is that the animal dies. If all five of those conditions are met, then it's the full offense. If some of them are not met, then it's a lesser offense. In other words, you perceive something as not a living being. You drop a heavy weight on it, and it turns out there's a living being in there. In that case, there's no, actually no offense. There's no intention to kill. There's no perception. And so as you go th through the day as a monk, you have to be very careful about your intentions and how you perceive things. Of course, you have to be careful about your motivations and actions. And you can apply the same analysis to your meditation. The reason you'd want to do this is because applying an analysis like this develops a lot of the factors for awakening. For instance, if you're careful as you go through the day, you have to be mindful to keep the rules in mind. And you have to be able to analyze your actions. What was the intention? What was the perception? That's analysis of qualities, the second factor for awakening. And of course, there's the effort that goes into this. And if you go through the day successfully, without having committed any offenses, without having harmed anybody, there can be a sense of rapture. And that can lead to calm. We've got five of the factors for awakening right there. All well, of them can be conducive to getting the mind into concentration. But you can bring the same analysis to your concentration practice. You have the intention to stay with the breath, and you've got the object, which is the breath. Then there's your perception. What perceptions are useful? Perceive the breath as a whole body process, perceive it as originating up from outside, perceive it as originating inside, perceive a cocoon of energy around the solid parts of the body. Lots of different ways you can perceive this. There are different levels of breath, just like there are different currents in the ocean. There's reading some place that there's a current that goes down, down in the in the cold waters of the Antarctic Ocean, and then travels up very, very slowly up the Atlantic, and hundreds of years later will come out further out. We have some breath energies in the body that go very slowly, others go very quickly. There's one level that as soon as you breathe in, it's already gone throughout the whole body. 
So you can perceive the breath in different ways and trying to find which perceptions are useful. And then there's the action itself, which is the act of focusing. We talk about watching the breath. Sometimes that's un unfortunate because it tends to involve the eyes a little bit too much. Think of sensing the breath, wearing the breath. Think of it all around you. See if that helps. What you're trying to do is become sensitive to the whole body. The image the Buddha gives, describing the states of concentration. There's getting the water through the ball of soap powder. There's the lake that's filled with the cool water of a spring that's fed again and again by rain. The lotuses that are immersed in the water and it's saturated from, with water from their roots to their tips, st still water. And there's a person covered from head to toe with a white cloth. Full body, full body, full body images. So you want to be sensitive to the full body. That would be the action. And then, of course, there's a the result. Ideally, you want to get the mind to settle down. And if it doesn't settle down, you can go back and look at those other four. What's wrong? Is your motivation not solid? Is, are the members of the committee in the mind arguing about whether you should stay here or should think about something else? If that's the case, we'll look into them. What other agendas do they have right now? This is where Jamahabua talks about using your discernment to foster concentration. Think about the drawbacks of that kind of thinking, or whatever the other agendas are, until you realize, okay, you don't really want to go there. It's not in your best interest. The Buddha talks about this as with a perception. He says, think of a young man or young woman fond of ornament, looking in the mirror and discovering there's a dead snake or a dead dog tied around his or her neck. have the same sense of disgust at unskillful thinking. Here you are trying to get the mind to settle down, and it's an important skill you're trying to develop. Yet the mind wants to sneak out and catch a few flicks, have a few snacks. For what purpose? That's the intention. Then you look at the perception, the different ways you perceive the breath. The mind is unwilling to settle down with one perception. What other perceptions can you try? Is the breath what you want to focus on right now? That's the second, third question, which is the object. Maybe the mind needs some contemplation of the parts of the body to settle down. Maybe it needs goodwill to settle down. Maybe it needs a little reflection on how death is going to come, and you're going to need skills at that point. This is where it's useful to remind yourself of the teaching of the Forest of Johns, that in doing meditation you're practicing how to die well. And the big dangers at death are going to be the, the hindrances. Your craving is going to determine where you're going to go. And if your craving gets diverted by the hindrances, who knows where it's going to go? Ill will can take you one place sensual desire someplace else, restlessness and anxiety someplace else, none of which are desirable places. Some people think that if you're born in line with your craving, that's good, you can go where, where you want. But your wants are very fickle. They're easily distracted. So you can't, if you can't deal with the hindrances right now, how are you going to deal with them when the body is a lot weaker? You're having to deal with pain, having to deal with the fact that you're going to be leaving this body. So you think about that for a while, and then you get back to the breath. This is the way we do death contemplation. You don't just think, sit there and think about death all day. You think about it just enough to get yourself motivated to be more on top of the practice. This way you can use this analysis of 
motivation or t intention, object, perception, action, result. To fine tune your meditation. And you can develop the same practice of awakening. In fact, you can develop them deeper. You have to be mindful to do this. You have to be engaged in analyzing the qualities of the mind as to what's skillful and what's not. And putting in the effort. When things finally settle down, there is that sense of refreshment. It starts out with the mental refreshment and then spreads into the body. Everything calms down, you can get into concentration. All the factors for awakening. When you get to the higher levels of concentration, they're based on equanimity. So it's good to borrow some teachings from the, the Vinaya every now and then. Apply them to the practice, even if you're not a monk. Think of how they apply to your daily life and also how they apply to your meditation. It's when you see the Buddha's teachings as a whole, both Dharma and Vinaya, that you really come to understand them. A while back there was someone who said the Buddha never really taught truths. He had our modern idea that truths are relative. But when you look how he uses the concept of truth in the Vinaya, you realize, okay, truth for him was very important. We had to have true perceptions about what's going on. If you're going to make an accusation, you have to be true in citing your source. Was it something you saw, something you heard, or something you just suspected? You have to be true in giving an account. As for the person being accused of an offense, he has to give an honest account of what he actually did. So the Buddha didn't have a postmodern attitude toward truth. Truth to him was very important. Truth of your perceptions. Truth of the authority in which you're speaking. Truth of giving an account of what you've done. You need to have this sense of truth in order to meditate. Again, it's not just a Vinaya issue, it's a meditation issue. When you're engaged in mindfulness, you want to be true in your perceptions. What kind of state is arising in the mind right now, so you know what to do with it. When you're talking, you want to be true about where your ideas come from. both when you're telling other people about them and also when you're talking to yourself. A lot of times you have a lot of ideas that you take as true, but when you stop to think about them, you got them simply because they, they made sense or you suspected them. Or somebody told you about them. But to what extent do you really know? It's a sobering thought, and it's very useful in helping to pry you loose from ideas that are not useful, and to look with a little bit of skepticism at the content of your thoughts. And there's the truth of giving an account. Again, it's your account to yourself. When you meditate, what did you do? What were the results? So here again, there's an important lesson you can learn from the Vinaya and apply it to the practice of training the mind. So remember, there is Dharma in Vinaya, which is why it's good to know both. <laughs>